Um, uh, so lying about history, lying about the past is, is not your normal talk, topic, title. Um, and uh, so I need to explain how it is that I got to the subject that um, I'm going to talk about today, and that is that um, when, when the internet first appeared back in the days, we called it the World Wide Web, and um, the, uh, the, one of the first things that began to happen was that people started putting historical information up there on the internet because, of course, anybody could. And, um, and then teachers like Wade and like myself, we started seeing um, papers from students citing information that they'd found online. And some of that information was really great, and some of it was really not so great. Um, does anybody recognize the name Ante Pavlich? One. See, somebody always knows. But uh, only if you're on a college campus, though. Or if you're in Croatia, where lots of people would recognize the name, because he was the dictator of Croatia during the Second World War, and um, a convicted war criminal after the war who did escape justice by hiding out somewhere in South America. But um, his regime was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people during the war just because they were who they were, not because they'd done anything wrong. And, um, and so Pavlich was one of the bad guys of World War II. And one of my students at Grinnell actually wrote a paper um, called Ante Pavlich, Great Hero of Croatian History. And I saw the title and I thought, okay, this is going to be really interesting because it must be ironic, you know. And, and then I read, I read the paper and it wasn't ironic at all. She had, um, she had unfortunately found her way to a couple of websites of Croatian emigres in Australia who, whose fathers and grandfathers had fought with the Pavlic regime and, and were trying to uphold his legacy as a great hero of Croatian history, not as a genocidal killer. And so um, when I showed her some things that, you know, she should have read from the library. She was really mortally embarrassed about it. And, and, and so it was one of those teachable moments. And, I, and that was really the first time I remember a student giving me something that was really egregious, that, using sources that were really egregious. And uh, ever since, me and every other teacher of history has, um, has spent time uh, standing in front of classes and saying, you know, you really shouldn't be using uh, these, these kinds of things that you find online without thinking about it really carefully because you never know. They could be good. They could not be good. Uh, maybe this will come back. And, uh, and so, you know, in standing in front of a classroom and saying, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, doesn't really get you very far. It's sort of like the old Charlie Brown cartoons, you know, the parents in the background going wow, 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 you know, and and so it, it really didn't work. And this had been driving me crazy as an educator um, because I knew that it wasn't the student's fault; it was my fault. I was somehow not getting my argument over in a way that made sense. And um, and so this is this is one thing that was rattling around in my head that was really bothering me. So um, the second, though, was um, that the so second thing that sort of led to where I am, to how I ended up here today, is that um, when I was, when my older son was in the fifth grade, so he's a freshman in college now, so a while ago, um, his teacher, his, um, his fifth grade teacher asked me to come and teach uh, something in their class. And I said, oh, well, what are they working on? And she said, well, the American Civil War. And I said, well, okay, except I'm a, 19th century Habsburg imperial historian, and, and she said, they're fifth graders. <laughs> You're a college professor. Just come and teach them something. And I said, okay, okay. So, so I went and I did, and, um, and, and, you know, and it, worked out, um, it worked out really well. I mean, I, I had such a wonderful time with those, those fifth graders, and they did something that stuck with me. And that is they did what fifth graders do. I, I had some exercises for them to do. And at the end, I gave them an assignment, some documents to work with. And, and I said, OK, now you have to do this, this assignment that, that I want you to do. And, and so they did what fifth graders do. They grabbed their best friend. I didn't even tell them to pair up. They just grabbed their best friend. And they sat down on the floor. They went over in the corner. Or they, you know, and, and they started laughing. And they were just having so much fun. And I was watching them. And I was thinking, OK, my students don't have fun. You know, they, they like my classes. I mean, I'm a popular teacher, but, but they, so they like my classes, but I, I don't hear anybody laughing. I don't, I, don't, I don't see them grabbing their friends and going and sitting over there and working together without being told to do that. And I, and I wondered, as I was driving home that day, what happened between the fifth grade and the 13th grade, freshman year of college, to beat all the fun out of history? You know, what were we doing as educators to, to just suck all the fun out of it? And uh, because, you know, my students would sit there and they'd take notes and they would, you know, they they did what they were supposed to do. But so, so these two things are rattling around in my head. How do I make my classes more fun? Because 
why shouldn't they be fun? There's no reason they shouldn't be. And, and, why, and how am I going to get my students to think more critically about sources that they find online? And um, because we know a lot about how people look for sources online, we know that they don't read them very critically. There's lots of research to validate this. And, and, and not, I'm just talking about students. You notice I said people, because this is true of everybody. They, they sit down with their best friend, Dr. Google, and they type something in to get an answer to a question that they have. And Dr. Google gives them something, and, um, and they look at it, and it looks kind of reasonable. And so then they go with that. And the number of politicians and you know, government officials and newscasters and writers and you, you name it, the number of people who have been sort of taken in by things they found online is, I don't know, a very large number. Um, and so we know people don't read very critically. The other thing we know, and this is more about um, people in education, students and teachers, is that we tend to see the internet um, in two ways. We tend to see it as a zone of extraction, a place to go get things that we need, and we see it as a zone of exchange, a place to trade information with one another. We send emails or text or whatever. And, um, and so, so we tend to see it in that way. But there's a lot of research to show that young people today tend to see the internet also as a place of creation, a place to make things, make videos, make silly cat pictures, make you know, whole new identities for themselves sometimes. They, you know, they, 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 it's a place to create art that they share with other people. It's a place of creative activity. This is one of the reasons that Minecraft is so incredibly popular, is because you make things, and, and then you get to do stuff with the things that you make. And so, um, so we, we know these things, and, and that was the, the final thing, is I wanted my students to do something that was a little more creative. And I don't know when it, all of this came together in my head, but it did. And, um, and I decided that I was going to have to, um, I was gonna have to create a whole new course. And, um, and, and that, that whole new course was going to uh, try to accomplish all three of these things. Get my students to think more critically about things they found online, have them laugh because they were having so much fun, and let them be creative. Turn them loose and let their creative juices flow and see what they came up with, as opposed to trying to just answer the questions that I'd given them. So, so let me just tell you um, uh, one thing about, um, to give you one example of why this is important. So what it used to be, and not quite so much anymore, but it used to be that if you typed Hitler into Google, one of the places you found yourself was here, the, the Hitler Historical Museum. Now it shows up on about the third page of Google results. Um, and so, you know, and if you're looking for a good source, well, it must be good because it says right there it's non-biased, as though you can be bi unbiased about Adolf Hitler. But <laughs> nevertheless, you know, it's non and it's a nonprofit museum, so it's a nonprofit agency. So you must, it must be good, right? Um, and, and if you go to the Hitler.org, you will find various photographs and some texts of Hitler speeches and things like that. So, so I found this because it showed up in a footnote of one of my students' papers. And so I thought, well, who would put up, who would create a museum called the Hitler Historical Museum? So if you go onto this page and you look around, It just tells you that it's, it is copyright, Hitler Historical Museum, and all rights are reserved, and there's no about page, no way to find out who's behind this. So I started off my class, this class that I taught called Lying About the Past, and, um, and I taught them how to, uh, how to find out more about this guy, or about this website. So, and, and this isn't going to actually work because I've exceeded my free lookups on who is, but you can, look up, you can look up for free who owns a particular website through whois.org. You just put in the domain name and you get a certain number of free um, domain lookups and then you have to pay for the service. So I've exceeded mine because I've used this a lot in presentations. But if you look it up, you find out that the um, hitler.org is owned by some organization called United so the word united, a space, a period, a space, and thought. United.thought. And it gives an address in California for where united.thought is headquartered. Well, so I, I said to my students, so figure out, what, what can you tell me about united.thought? So they poked around. And one of them used Google Street View. Got to pivot a little. And United.Thought is actually located right here, above this deli. <laughs> they don't have a big banner that says Hitler Historical Museum. 
you know, or Hitler.org, probably not a great way to bring in friends. But, but, so they, but so there they are, located above a deli. That didn't tell us anything. So we tried another sleuthing. Uh, and uh, and students kept poking around, and they went to, among other places, archive.org, where you can look up the entire history of a website. And one of the things that they found was that um, this older page, and this call, kind of calls into question the unbiased nature, um, on Hitler's birthday, they had a birthday cake for him on the website. This, you know, at this point, you know it's not a non-biased um, presentation. Um, and so at archive.org, you can look all that up. You can also, one of the great things about going to the library is that there's all this sort of serendipitous finding of things. Well, online, sometimes you find things serendipitously as well. Um, one of my students found that um, the address where united.thought is organized, they have bed bugs. <laughs> so <laughs> they're in the bed bug registry. So, just the kinds of stuff you find online sometimes. So, so I can feel a little sorry for the guys running the Hitler Museum, you know. Not, not a lot sorry, but a little sorry. So, um, so anyway, I created this course and, and, and called Lying About the Past. And, uh, and so I told my students that the first half of the semester was going to be a standard history course. We were going to study the history of historical hoaxes. And there's a long history of historical hoaxes. We studied the Hitler Diaries, which was a big scam back in the 70s. We studied, um, we studied the Piltdown Man, an archaeological hoax. You, know, we, you name it. There, my favorite was um, a hoax from a New York newspaper um, from the 19th century. They, it was at a time when um, telescopes were really improving rapidly and all sorts of um, astronomical discoveries were being made and um, you know, new moons of Jupiter and that sort of thing. And, and, um, and so there's this very prominent astronomer lived in New York and he was famous for, for improving the telescope. And this newspaper editor knew that this guy had gone to South Africa to view a, um, a, an eclipse. And so he would be unavailable to contradict the stories that then ran in the newspaper. And, and the stories they ran quoted him extensively about his new discoveries of a civilization on the moon. And, and it was amazing, these people that lived on the moon, they were really cool, they had wings like bats. And they, they flew around and they, um, and, and they were incredibly peaceful. And, and it was like utopia. Well, if you studied your 19th century American history, you know that utopian communities were springing up all over the United States. And so people thought, wow, the perfect utopian community, it's on the moon and they have wings. I mean, and are they angels? Are they, are they bats? You know, we're not really sure. And, and so the, these newspaper stories were incredibly popular. The newspaper achieved its goal of selling tens of thousands of copies of the newspaper. And then the astronomer came back from South Africa and he said, I never said that. You know, but the newspaper editors didn't care because they'd sold the newspapers. So, so we learned all about that. And the students wrote a couple of papers about these historical hoaxes. They did a kind of standard thing. And, um, and then the second half of the semester is where it got different. I told them that they had to, for the second half of the semester, they had to create a historical hoax and they had to turn it loose on the internet to see if they could fool anybody. <laughs> and, and they had, just for two weeks, because we, we weren't gonna create what historians like to call zombie facts, um, and you, things that you, no matter how untrue they are, you just can't kill them. And, um, and so one of the common zombie facts is that, uh, people always wonder why did Hitler hate the Jews so much? And one of the answers that floats around as a zombie fact is that he had a Jewish grandmother who, who mistreated him as a child. She beat him and she was really horrible to him and so he hated the Jews because of her. Hitler did not have a Jewish grandmother. He, he just didn't. But I can't tell you the number of students over the years who have said to me, well, you know he had a Jewish grandmother. She was really mean to him. And because it makes sense that you would hate somebody because somebody had mistreated you as a child. Well. Um, and so we weren't going to create a zombie fact or two that was just going to float out there forever. Um, but, uh, and what I hadn't really, I, I knew that this was taking my students and myself out onto really thin ice. Because historians don't have a, um, you know, we don't have a Hippocratic oath. We, you know, we don't promise that we'll never lie. It's implied that we won't. Um, it's understood that we won't. But we never said that we wouldn't. Um, you know, we never put our hands up and s swore. But, but there's a common community value among historians that we won't. And so, we're, so I was taking my students out onto really, really thin ice. And, and I said to them, if this doesn't make you a little queasy, then you're not paying close attention. Because it makes me really queasy. 
And, and, and so um, we spent the whole semester talking about ethics. The ethics of the hoaxes that we studied early on and then the ethics of what we were doing. Most history courses you talk about ethics in the first day or two of the class and it's all about plagiarism and, and then it never comes up again. But in my class we talked about ethics every single day because we had to decide where the lines were. Um, was, was what we were doing going to cross some ethical standard that we had set? And so, for instance, right away, you know, I gave them a couple of boundaries to begin with. I said, no hoaxes about health care because too many people depend on the Internet for information about their health. And so there would be absolutely nothing funny about creating a hoax about that. Um, and um, we couldn't do anything that, that broke federal wire fraud statutes, for instance. So they had to learn those. Um, the, most, the easiest way to break a federal wire fraud statute is to invite people to send you money in exchange for something that doesn't exist. Um, and so they send you money and you don't send anything back and that's a federal crime and I didn't want to go to jail. Um, I'm, a, I'm a tenured faculty member and for sure I could be fired for breaking federal law. So, um, so, you know, so we set a whole bunch of boundaries like that and I also told them they couldn't do anything about the American Civil War because too many people knew too much about the Civil War, especially where we live in Virginia, um, and so they'd never fool anybody. But, um, so, but then they had to decide the rest. And so and here's an example. One of the things that, one of the hoaxes that they were discussing in the second iteration of the class was, um, and this was before all the revelations about the NSA and spying on people's cell phone conversations and that sort of thing. They, they decided that one of the hoaxes they were considering was that baby monitors, that, that some unnamed government agency had implanted a chip in baby monitors which allowed the government to spy on, you know, everything that was being said in your home through your baby monitors. See, you're thinking like, that could happen, you know? <laughs> She's totally believing this, that could happen. And, and so who knows when baby monitors were invented? Anybody? I didn't know until they started doing the research. They were invented in the 1930s in response to the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. When the Lindbergh family's child was, so rich people were then in fear of their, their babies being kidnapped for ransom, and so they developed technologies to help protect their children. Um, and so, uh, so that's when baby monitors were invented. But you can imagine that people would believe this, right? That, that baby monitors were being used as a spying technology. And then all the NSA revelations broke shortly thereafter, so then they really would have believed it. But one of the students in my class, uh, George Mason is really an intergenerational university. We have students of every age. And um, one of the students in my class, in, in that group, she put her hand up and she said, you know, no, we can't do that. And they said, why not? It's perfect. And she said, well, I got to tell you, I'm a mom and, and I depended on baby monitors for my sanity. And, and uh, if we undermine people's faith in that technology, that would be really bad. And the other students in the group said, oh, yeah, you're right. And so that was off the table right there. You know? And so, so they had these really rich discussions about the ethics of what they were doing. Um, so the, the first time around, the students created, the first time I taught the class, the students created a, a hoax called The Last American Pirate. Think about that for a minute. The Last American Pirate. It's kind of like giving, telling somebody, you know, okay, the way you get there is you get out here on university and you drive that way, uh, and when you get to the last traffic light, turn left. How do you know that was the last traffic light? <laughs> <laughs> so, was that the last, is there another one? So, so the last American pirate, and it was a guy named Edward Owens. Now Edward Owens was a real person. He lived in Middlesex County, Virginia, and um, in the, after the Civil War, and uh, he was a farmer, but, um, and they found him in the census records, and they wanted a name that if you Googled it, would be really common, you know, like John Smith or something like that, just really common names. And so, uh, so Edward Owens they picked, and the other reason they picked Edward was because he shows up in no one's genealogy. They, they excluded everybody who showed up in someone's genealogy because they didn't want a genealogist to find their website and say, my great-grandfather was a pirate, you know, they, because he wasn't. And because they, they decided on their own that that wouldn't be funny, that that wouldn't be nice. And so, they, they, so they, they, it took them a long time to find a common name that didn't show up in somebody's genealogy, but so they found Edward. And, um, and so, so they created the last American pirate. And the way that they, the vehicle for how they did it, some of you will appreciate. Um, so they created a, a student, a fictitious student, and she wrote a blog because she was in a history class and the history professor required them to write a blog about their research. And so it's a, it's a blog about her senior research project. And, and so she's writing all about how she found out about this guy, this local legend, Edward Owens. 
Um, and so um, one of the students wrote the blog, and the other students contributed all the information, but one of them wrote it the whole time because they would be in her voice. If, the, if everybody wrote posts, then the voice would be a little strange. So, so you know, it had to do with a sandwich in a local deli. And, you know, so, so they had a lot of fun writing that. Um, by the way, if you do a domain lookup on lastamericanpirate.org, it belongs to Mills Kelly, professor of history at George Mason University, <laughs> which nobody did. If they had done that, they would have known there was something weird about that. Uh, so they, uh, they also they decided that for, for it to be a real hoax, there had to be a YouTube video or two. I mean, for, you know, for it to be true, it had to have a YouTube video or two. And my favorite one of the videos that they created was an interview with one of my colleagues, Ted McCord, who's a historian of that period. <laughs> and, and, they sat down, and they sat down with Ted and they said, okay, here's what we're doing, and so here's your role. The, the, the student who was pretending to be the student said, you know, told him that this whole story, and he listens carefully, and he says, yeah, that's gotta be a hoax. Can't be true, it's gotta be a hoax. Because this was like the double switch, you know? How, how, it, why would, if it was a hoax, why would you put up a video of somebody saying it has to be a hoax? They're trying to get really sneaky here. <laughs> so, so, they, um, so, so they have a couple of videos there as well. Um, you know, so they went, to, they went to a lot of trouble on this. Um, and the, the, the part that was the most controversial was that they came to me, controversial later, not so controversial for them, but they came to me and they said, you know, for this really to, to work, there has to be a Wikipedia entry for Edward Owens. Because people will look for him in Wikipedia. So there has to be a Wikipedia entry. What do you think? And I said, well, what do you think? It's not what I think, it's what you think. And so they argued about it for about a week about whether they should do it or not because it definitely violates Wikipedia's community standards. And so they finally decided, well, we're gonna do it. We're gonna feel a little uneasy about it, but we're gonna do it. And then, but of course, at the end of two weeks, we'll create a new entry that says, well, this was a hoax. And if you go, if you look up Edward Owens Pirate in Wikipedia, it's an entry about the hoax, not about, not about Edward Owens' supposed pirate. And you have to work all the way back through the history of the entry to find their, their hoax entry. Um, so that did result, by the way, um, in my classroom's IP address, my office IP address, and my home IP address being blocked from access to Wikipedia for about six months, which really uh, made my kids unhappy because then when they were doing their schoolwork, they couldn't get to Wikipedia. <laughs> so it didn't make me all that unhappy, but it made them unhappy. And my Wikipedia account was banned for a while. So, um, and, 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 the, and the, the, the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, um, uh, he is friends with our new university president, and the president likes to sort of poke me about that every once in a while. You know, Jimmy Wales doesn't really like you very much. So, uh, but I'm okay with that. Um, so, so, they, so they, they, they created this pirate, and, and they fooled a few people. But you know who they mostly fooled? And this is the best part. They fooled some history teachers. Some history teachers found their way to Jane Browning's blog, Jane Browning being the fictitious person, found their way to her blog, and they started posting comments on her blog about, I'm so impressed with the way you're doing your research for your project, and, and, and I'm really, I think it's really cool that you're using YouTube and, and a blog and, and all this new media stuff. And my students came to me and they said, these are history teachers. Why are they getting fooled by this? You know, and I said, because they're not doing what we ask people to do, and that is look carefully at the sources. If they'd done a domain lookup, they would have found that the Jane Browning's blog belonged to me. That was a little strange. So, um, and I did, one of them was actually somebody I knew. She was a professor in another university, and I had to call her up and say, it's a hoax. <laughs> Stop commenting. So, uh, so, but then the second time around, when I taught the class the second time around, uh, there, were, there were two hoaxes, and, um, and one of them was um, about, it involved the Star-Spangled Banner because they were doing it in 2012, and they decided that they, um, that they were going to, uh, the, some fictitious person would have found in the attic, in a trunk, a series of beer recipes, brewery recipes, from Brown's Brewery. Now, Brown's Brewery is the location where the Star-Spangled Banner was actually sewn by the Seamsters. So uh, it was in that brewery that the flag was created. And, uh, and this was 2012, and the city of Baltimore had a whole lot of craft breweries, and, and so they thought they would like put this, brewery, this new this beer of 1812 recipe out there, and then people would be um, all excited about it. And they actually did fool one radio DJ from Baltimore who talked it up for about two hours, and then he moved on to something else. So, but they didn't really fool too many other people. But, 
But the, the cool part for me as a, as a professor was that my students, because we're in the Washington area and the Star Spangled Banner um, hangs in the Smithsonian, they thought, we'll just make a pilgrimage. We'll go to the Smithsonian and see this flag that is part of our hoax. And so they went down there and they saw on the wall, the card next to the flag said that it was created in Chenoweth's Brewery. And they came back to class and they said, that's wrong. It was Brown's Brewery. The Browns sold the brewery to the Chenoweth family five years later in 1817. And, and so the Smithsonian has it wrong. What do we do? They said, simple. You figure out who's the curator responsible for that exhibit. You contact the curator and say, your card's wrong. And so they did. And the curator wrote them back and said, can you send me your sources on that? And they did. And they changed the card. So if you go to the Smithsonian now, it says Brown's Brewery instead of Chenoweth Brewery. So um, the, the other um, ironic piece to that was that the second group of students created a whole series of Wikipedia entries that were 100% true because they had the benefit of looking at the previous class and seeing the controversy that had surfaced about the false Wikipedia entry, and they decided they didn't want to do that. So in, but they still needed Wikipedia support for their hoax. So they, they created a series of true Wikipedia entries, um, and those were deleted by the Wikipedia editors because they were in the service of a hoax even though they were totally true. And this led to a really energetic discussion among Wikipedia editors about whether that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But, um, but my students were kind of unhappy about that. But they were true, you know. So, um, so they, they, they learned a lot about that. Um, they, uh, and, and at the end of the semester, for both semesters, I then as I always do, I'm very self-critical about my teaching, and so I assessed, had I accomplished my goals? For sure, they'd had a wonderful time. There was so much laughter in my classroom, and, it, and in fact, the second semester, um, once the professor teaching in the room next to me caught up with me after class, and she said, what's going on in your room? Your students are really laughing a lot. And I said, oh, it's the work they're doing is make, just cracking them up. And she said, really? You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, it was just a complete puzzle to her that, that a history class could be cracking up the students. So, um, so that, for sure, that was an easy assessment. I won on that. Um, but the, the harder assessment was whether or not they had become more critical consumers of information that they found online. And, um, and I know that they, I won on that also because about a half a dozen of the students who took those, one of those two sections of the course, um, they, uh, they're high school history teachers now. And, and they've written to me about how they've taken the lessons from that and used it with their own students. And a couple of other people said to me, uh, you know, you've ruined the internet for me. <laughs> because now when I look stuff up, I immediately, instead of just taking it, I say, well, really? I need to look. You know, and and they say, one of them said to me, it takes me hours to browse the web now to find small pieces of information <laughs> because I have to look under the hood for everything just to make sure it's really true. And, um, and so that's the kind of assessment that, that make, you know, sort of warms the heart of the teacher. Um, so so I, it, you know, it really did work. The, the postscript to this um, is that I'm not allowed to teach the course anymore. And, um, and that's because, the, you know, so the class makes me, as I said, it makes me queasy. Well, it made my colleagues in my own department queasier. And, um, and they decided that, it, that, in their view, it wasn't really appropriate. And um, so they said I could, I could teach the class again, but I could, the students couldn't turn the hoax loose. They could sort of storyboard it, you know, in, in class and present it to one another in class, but they couldn't actually turn it loose on the internet. And I said, yeah, that's just going to suck all the life right out of it. And, you know, and so I, you know, so I could have kept teaching it, but not under the terms that I thought it should be taught. So, um, so I'm still a little sad, you can tell, but, because um, I do think it's the best class I ever taught. But, the, um, but, but in particular, because I hadn't anticipated that we would spend so much time talking about ethics. And, and I did a search the other day about, um, about historians and ethics. And I looked for books and articles published on this subject. And, and I found two books, one in German, one in English, and uh, one special issue of a journal of the history of ideas and, and about three other journal articles. So in all the thousands of years of historical scholarship, about eight publications about historians and ethics, except for stuff about plagiarists. So, so, and nothing about teaching the ethics of the historical profession, not one article or book. So, um, and that kind of makes me sad makes me a little sad because we've got to do something about that. We've got to figure out more ways to work more ethical dilemmas into our, into our classroom. So that's what I wanted to t tell you about. And uh, now it's a great time for some questions from you. And I think they want you to use the microphone when you're asking your question. You come over to the microphone. And if you're a student, just uh, tell us your name and what you're studying. Uh, 
Quick poll, how many of you would want to take that class? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, questions or comments? How big were your class sizes? Great question about how big the classes were. The first time around, there were only about 15 students in the class, and so they worked as one group. Um, I divided them up kind of into production mode, so, and said, and they had, or they divided themselves up, and so some of them were better with the tech side, some of them were better as writers, some better as researchers. Second time around, I had about 35 students, um, so they had two hoaxes instead of one. Um, and I was telling people at dinner last night, I, um, I told them that, that under one circumstance, I would take them all out for dinner at the restaurant of their choice within reason. Um, and, uh, and that was, if they could show me tape or a clip of, you know, at the end of the local news, they have the happy talk moment where the newscasters just kind of chit chat with one another right at the very end. And, um, and so I said, you know, if you can show me a clip of the local, local news anywhere in the United States where the, the newscasters say, hey, now here's something I bet you didn't know. And you know, did you know there was this pirate guy named Edward Owens? You know, if they if they could show me that, I would take them all out to dinner. But they didn't. They did, that didn't happen. So, yeah. So I, I think I'm in the same. My name's Nick Mason. I'm English department and European studies. I, I, at some level, I think I'm in the same camp as your colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very much admiring it at some level, but also being. Mildly horrified. Right. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. So, so uh, let, let me give you an analogy. I was thinking of. Well, how would you respond if you found out that a computer science class were training was training students to create a virus that when stu people clicked on it, it infected their computer and said, "Ha ha, be more careful with your sort with what right. you click on." Right. I mean, yeah. is that essentially? Okay. So that's that's a great way of framing it. It's a great way of framing it, and um, and and I'll tell you why it doesn't work for me. And, um, and that is, but it's close. And, and the reason is because I told my students exactly that kind of thing. So that they had to think about the consequences of somebody finding that. And so it really had to be a hoax about nothing. So a beer recipe from 1812, that's kind of nothing. Whether Edward Owens was the last American pirate or not, not a big deal. So, so they, had to, they had to really focus it down so that it was, it was really inconsequential, but consequential enough that somebody might pay attention to it. Um, and so, so the virus example that you just gave actually does damage to somebody's computer. But doesn't that essentially completely undermine your discipline in terms of saying what we're doing is inconsequential, yeah. we can tell lies, it doesn't hurt anyone, but if someone infects someone's computer, that's real damage. So uh, again, I like the way you frame that because um, it doesn't undermine the discipline, I don't think, because that, I think that there's a lot of history that is really inconsequential, uh, that just doesn't matter that much. And, um, and there, and, but there are little tiny bits of history. And now I'm somebody who studies the everyday lives of people. Um, and so just the sort of the daily activities of daily life, um, that was repetitive. The, um, the, so the activities of daily life is something that really fascinates me, of people who would never show up in a history book otherwise. Um, and so I'm not negating their lives by what I just said, um, but I do think that there are, there are things that are consequential and things that aren't. And, um, and the students had to think about that. I really wanted them to think about that. I mean, that's a hard, pro that's a hard proposition to, to work your way through. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, that a lesson that, and, and I took this back to my students um, later, I was talking about this class um, at the University of Virginia and, and um, my alma mater, so I'm not real happy about Saturday's football result. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, but so uh, one, of the, one of the graduate students there said, uh, one of the hoaxes was from the second time around was um, in 1897, there was, um, so a genealogist, um, again, sort of found in a trunk in the attic, some documents from her great, great, or great, great, great uncle who she believed might have been a serial killer in New York in 1897. Now, in 1897 in New York, there was a lot of concern that Jack the Ripper had moved from London to New York because he had stopped murdering people in London and, and prostitutes were being murdered in New York in 1897 and there was a lot in the newspapers concern about that. Um, and so the students, the, the true Wikipedia entries that the students wrote were about these murders. And, um, and so the ones that got deleted from Wikipedia. And so, um, one of the grad students at UVA said, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with that. And the reason I'm really uncomfortable with that was because these women died, you know, first of all, their lives were bad to begin with, and then they died in really bad circumstances, and then you deployed them um, in the service of humor. And I don't think that's funny. 
And, and so I called my students back together. This was two semesters later. And I said, so this is an issue we, you know, we didn't think about. Why didn't we think about that? And we spent, and I, I, out of 35, I probably got about 25 of them there. And we spent two hours talking about why we hadn't thought of that. And so the learning that came out of that, I think, was really incredible. Um, and so, so I'm willing to take some risks with the discipline um, in order to learn things that are really important. Um, so so I, um, I, I worked with somebody from an English department recently on, because um, she, she had said, you know, sort of like a deformation of the discipline. And so she and I worked on how could you, how could you really tear up the values of your discipline? You know, what would that look like? So she's somebody who studies not only um, literature, but the books themselves as physical objects. And so I said, so what makes you the queasiest? And she said, I hate it when people tear up books. And I said, OK, let's go to the used bookstore. And they have a free bin. And so we got a couple of books. And we just stood there, and we started tearing them up. And it made us feel bad. It's like, why would you do that? It makes you feel bad just me talking about it. I can see it on your face. And so it depends on which said, books. I mean. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> wait. So, OK, so why does it depend? Why does it depend? I, 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 yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. Well, so, actually, yeah, I could give you, I give you a longer answer. Yeah, you so, want, but. But so but you can see we're at, like, yeah. we're at first principles here. Yeah. And, and, and history classes almost never get to those kinds of first principles. And so this was a way of getting to that. Um, in computer science, it would be, computer science, uh, anybody a computer science major? So you know, you're supposed to write the most elegant code you can, right? The most efficient to get to solve the problem. So what would be the most inefficient way that you could still solve that problem? You know, consume the most iron from the com central computer center here um, trying to get that to work. And, um, and so that's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. And so we thought about, you know, what are the first principles that we're, that we're after and, and how do we get to those? So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a little horrifying, but I think it's worth it for the learning. So, thanks. Yeah. My name is Juan Castaños and I'm a political science major. And I was just curious with what you found in kind of the way your students reacted to the hoax assignment, did research papers or anything change as a result of that? Um, so I've only had, um, Let's see, of the students who took those classes for me, only two of them then took a subsequent class for me. Um, and so I can't really say whether their research or writing skills improved. Um, what I can say is that I never saw groups of students work so hard on a research project in a history class. And in a way, it's because it mattered to them. Uh, because they were going to put it out there for public consumption. And, um, and, and they knew that it was going to be really hard to fool anybody. And, and so they were going to have to work really hard. So in the pirate hoax, they brought in consultants. They brought in a grad student who worked on the history of the Chesapeake Bay to learn about what kind of boat would Edward Owens have used. And, um, what were, and they brought in somebody who worked on law enforcement in post-Civil War Virginia. And you know, how would that have worked? And you know, a, a professor who talked to them about that. And they, um, they worked with somebody who was an underwater archaeologist. And, so, and they did this entirely on their own. I didn't say, well, you know, we have this grad student or there's this professor. They just went out and found those people. And, and as opposed to finding five or six really reasonable sources that would be good enough to get the paper done and get the grade they wanted and move on to the next assignment. So, so that's kind of the answer, I think, is that they, they themselves went way beyond anything I had asked them to do. And that's what you hope. So Thank you. thanks. And I know some of you have to leave and go to class, and that's, that's fine. So don't, don't be shy about getting up and going. Yes. Hi, my name is Matt. And uh, I have a question. So. Um, it's it's a little bit more broad now, just for yeah. your class. But um, how do you how would you define you know like um, true accurate history? Because um, you know you say oh you might put some things out there, but what if the history that we have now are just some Wikipedia posts from like the 1300s or whatever <laughs> 400 BC well, that people just you know like how would you define how are you so confident? And this is just even more broader. Well, so so I'm I'm. You know, one of the things, you go far enough along in your study of history, the more skeptical you get. I mean, we're, we're, we become sort of permanently skeptical about everything uh, because people lied, ha have been lying about the past for a very long time, and they've been doing it in a whole lot of ways. One, they've written, you know, histories that, that made them look good or their king look good or whatever. You know, Winston Churchill is famous for saying, history will be kind to me because I intend to write it, and then he did. Um, and he, he, he looked pretty good in those books he wrote about his career. So, um, you know, and he didn't lie, but he certainly made the best, put the best face on his own actions. Um, and so, um, and, you know, people put things in the archives or they don't put things in the archives. And, and so, and historians 200 years later are stuck with what's there. 
and so you have to always ask yourself what should have been there and isn't. Um, and so, so I think your, your concern is a great one. You know, is, are these like Wikipedia entries from the 1300s? Um, and the further back in the past you go, the, the thinner the evidence gets. And, and the more you have to rely on archaeological evidence, then you have to sort of figure out what that might mean. And, and so um, it gets really hard to be, you know, all that accurate. And, and, but historians are just skeptics, and they should be all the time. So. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, I'm curious, you talked about um, the amount of success your hoaxes had while they were still hoaxes, but what kind of success did they have after they were, after they were, I don't know. Exposed? Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, the students exposed themselves in two of the three cases. They got exposed in one of the three cases. Um, the, the serial killer hoax, they tried, they decided that the way they were going to put it out there was on Reddit. And, um, you know, and there, there's, a, there's a Reddit, a subreddit for everything. And, uh, and so there's a serial killer subreddit. And so they thought they would put it out there. And if you can go and read that whole transcript, it went on for about 25 minutes. In the first 10 or 15 minutes, hundreds of people weighed in from all around the world on this serial killer subreddit saying, oh, this is cool. You need to get an agent. This is a Hollywood movie, you know. Blah. <laughs> and, then, and then one person who knew something about Wikipedia went into the entries that they had linked to and said, wait a minute, all three of these Wikipedia entries were posted within 10 seconds of each other. This has to be a hoax. <laughs> and it was over, 21 minutes. And so you know, that was minute 21 in that Reddit conversation. And then it was just over. Um, and, so, uh, and so they learned that Redditors collectively were smarter than they were. And you know, the, collective <laughs> intelligence, the collective intelligence of that group of people beat them. Um, and so, but, so one of the things I've done over the years is, is searched to see if the things that they created in the hoax ever showed up again as, as facts, and they haven't, at least not online. So I have a, one was referenced earlier, and, that, and that's in terms of where you start to, to really be a skeptic. So you have to do research and you have to understand history, but there has to be a line somewhere about where you actually decide to start really questioning it. Right. And so, where do you feel that that is? Because I think you know the the um, I saw a lecture the other day that that said um, somebody said that the the you know that you've really studied the humanities when you realize that the answer to almost every question is well it depends <laughs> and and because it kind of does and um, and so so I'll give you two two quick examples. One is uh, so I studied Czech history as Wade mentioned and. And, um, and the first president of Czechoslovakia was Thomas Masaryk. And, and so I was working in the, the Imperial Archives in Vienna, and there were, there were the, the Austrian authorities spied on all these Czech politicians really extensively, and so they had big dossiers on each of them. And I found those dossiers really useful for my research, not so much because I believed the spies, but, but the spies had a catalog of who was where, when, and what did they say, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, and so I'd saved Masaryk for last because I knew his dossier would be really big. And so the, the archivist brought me just one box. And I was expecting a dozen boxes. And there was one box, and in it was one folder with one slip of paper that said contents removed to the archive of the president of Czechoslovakia in 1922. So when he was the president, he got his archive from his spy, his spy dossier removed and taken to Prague. So I was in Prague a few weeks later, and I requested the same material. And again, one box, one folder, one slip of paper that said contents missing. So why? Was he responsible for that? Was some uh, supporter of his after his death responsible for deleting all of those files from the archives? Was some archivist off cataloging them and had forgotten where to put them? You know, who knows? But they were, they were gone and, and so unavailable. So that makes me skeptical. And I'm always going to be skeptical because of that. Um, so, uh, the, the, but the second I example, and I think this is a really wonderful example, one of the best books on the Holocaust is a book called Neighbors by a political scientist at NYU named Jan Gross. And it's about a moment in World War II in Eastern Poland, the part of Eastern Poland which had been occupied by the Soviets in 1941. Um, after the Germans swept through when they invaded the Soviet Union, the, um, in this town of Yedwabne, the, um, the, the, the town was divided. There were about 1,100 Gentiles and about 1,100 Jews in the, in the town. And, the leaders of the Gentile population came to the, si the single German who was in the village. There was only one German there. He was just responsible for policing the intersection in town. Um, and they said, so in the morning, we're going to massacre all the Jews. 
And he, his response was essentially, sure. And he didn't care. And that's what they did the next day. They killed all but five of the Jews in the village. Five people survived. Um, one of them was the cook who worked for that German. He hid her in the basement because she was a good cook. He didn't care about anything else. He just wanted to keep his cook. Uh, and so, and the other four managed to escape. And so after the war, the, the, the surviving residents, the non-Jewish residents of that village, swore to a whole series of commissions that that never happened, that the Jews just fled because they knew the Germans were after them. And so they fled. We didn't kill them. Never happened. And the German had died in the war. And so he wasn't around to say anything. Um, and so, but there were five people who had survived. And all five of them said, here's what happened. So the standard methodology of the historian is to let the mountain of evidence outweigh the tiny little bit of evidence. Because there were hundreds of people from that village who said that never happened. And there were five who said that it did. Gross's argument is that in the, in the instance of genocide, we have to accept the testimony of the survivors first until they can be proven false, as opposed to accepting the testimony of the, the people who have an agenda. And, um, and that's pretty controversial, because historians are used to accepting the mountain over the molehill. Um, and so you, know, you have to think about the circumstance. Okay. One other little thing is that your students put all this effort into creating hoaxes that mm -hmm. still haven't resurfaced. Well, what about the other people who like either post something online or do create a hoax, I guess, that is still like Oh, there are thousands of them wandering around. Yeah, there are thousands of them wandering around. I think one of the longest um, running Wikipedia hoaxes was, it was tiny, um, and that it was in the biographical entry for President Calvin Coolidge. And you know, in a biographical entry, the standard is you have the name, and then in parentheses, you have the date of birth and the date of death, assuming the person's dead. And, um, and so somebody, Coolidge was born in the 19th century and died in the 20th century. Somebody changed his birth date. They changed one number so that he was then born in the 18th century instead of the 19th century. And, um, and so he lived like 140 years, according to his, his, but we skim over that. We see the name and the date of birth, date of death. So unless you needed to know when he was born, he just kind of phased right by that. And so for years, the Wikipedia entry said that Calvin Coolidge had been like 140 when he died, which would explain why he was known as Silent Cal. But, <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, some stuff just goes on for forever. So, well, I know you guys have to get to class. Thanks so much for coming today. It was really great to be able to talk with you. And thanks for hosting me at your, at your really wonderful university.